This is a summary video on a video which got a lot of views but frankly deserves a whole lot more and sadly I think that it might be overlooked by many people who need it because you know it's a two hour video so what I'm trying to do here is condense it down. For those of you who want to watch it in its entirety I'm going to have the link down below. It is from Richard Grannon. The title of it is Modern Love is Now a Savage Battlefield. How do we heal the divide? Let's start with one of my favorite quotes from Grannon. He says, a life without love is miserable. A life with love is bearable. Everything that we suffer is worthwhile if we have love. A loveless world is not worth living in, and people are already choosing to check out. There's different ways of checking out. There's loads of ways of turning away from life. Killing yourself is the most literal, raw version of that, but many of us turn away from life. Everybody in here who's been traumatized will have at least spent a period of time where they turned away from life because life is painful, life is frightening, life is risk. Grennan's hypothesis is that we are living in a love, intimacy, vulnerability, adverse culture. And he says you can't have intimacy without vulnerability, you can't have love without intimacy. And what's happened is that aggression, hostility, and indifference has replaced affection and warmth. We're all signaling to one another that we're invulnerable and independent or counter-dependent. So love cannot flourish. Why is this happening? Well, he says that it's because of consumer culture, rigid individualism, psychologization, and toxic passivity. So with a consumer culture, we now have people who view themselves as individuals who are to be pleasured. Their self-concept is, what's in it for me? How can I get what I want? How can I enjoy all the options? Ideological consumerism is the problem, Grannon says, resulting from decades of this ideological infection. And this, he says, is what breeds rigid individualism, which is not necessarily narcissism, but is often confused with that. It's basically a rejection of the need to be in a group, this attitude of, I don't need anyone else. And he says this is unnatural and creates lovelessness. Furthermore, it's untrue. We're tribal social creatures. We need each other. We need to contribute. That when we're not contributing to others, we become dysregulated emotionally and hormonally. And also we experience a sense of lowered status because status is a group orientated denominator. And so apart from this, depression and higher anxiety results. With psychologization, people are misappropriating the use of psychology into group dynamics. And finally, the toxic passivity is again, tying into this consumer culture where we have this need to be filled passively with products and pleasure. The outcome is that we're trying to turn people and relationships into consumable things or products. It's very anti-life, Grannon says. There's no reverence for self. And when there's no reverence for self, there's no reverence for others. You start treating other people with indifference or as a frustrated end user. It's like being disappointed with a product that fails or falls short. And so the solution he offers is to swim against the culture but he doesn't say it's going to be easy. He says it's going to be hard. What you can do is insist on personal boundaries, he says, and try to instill these values into others, although that's going to take time because we're swimming against the current in this love phobic culture. Many of us right now are witnessing the woke culture agenda, which has been going on for decades to feminize men, where there's a lot of castration themes that we are seeing in the media, in the entertainment. His advice on how to counteract this on the everyday is to be a moral person in a completely amoral society. Break out of social conditioning. Individuate. No longer be a mass human being. Be an individual. But it's difficult. Yet at the same time, if you don't tread that path, Grennan says it's useless. He also says, you don't fight ideology with ideology, and in this case, the ideologies are falsehoods, dogmas, lying, which we'll talk more about later, but he says, you fight by sticking to principles like honesty, even if it ends up in solitude because you don't fit in. What are the elements of a good relationship? Well, he outlines trust, fair exchange, respect, loyalty, and he also addresses 
idealism, romance, and fantasy in relationship and how it factors in to having a good relationship. With trust, many of us come from traumatic histories in our relationships, and that interferes with our ability to trust in our relationships. Why? Because people don't respect boundaries. For example, we have a lot of increased promiscuity. In terms of having a fair exchange, he emphasizes this is not about equality. Only in math are things truly equal. So what is a fair exchange? He encourages having a conversation about this to avoid confusion about boundaries, expectations, and consequences of broken rules. With respect, this has really been lost between genders because people don't respect themselves, so they can't respect others. For example, we see a lot of lying going on. And with loyalty, we're in the midst of an options crisis where, yes, there's a lot of choice, but there's a diminishment of loyalty. For example, you don't see loyalty on jobs anymore. Maybe you do in friendships where the intimacy level is low risk, but the attitude is why be loyal to a partner? Because some would argue, well, it's an agreement and honoring contracts is a moral issue in this amoral world. But the problem is that a lot of people see love as a battlefield where contracts don't need to be honored. And if they have no moral compass, well, then there's no reason not to. On the subject of idealism, romance, and fantasy, he says, if unconscious, these ideals possess the relationship, and ideology exists in shadow. One person in the audience said that chivalry is untruthful, and that what's better is having an open heart. But Granin said to have an open heart, you must have an integrated shadow and operate from authenticity. Chivalry is masculine, protective. It provides. Yes, it's kind but it also takes charge and is in control. The problem is that many of us have unconscious rules or givens that are unspoken. For example, one might say, well, it's okay for the man to be in control if he's skilled at it. See, there's a clash with values, especially if we're talking about hard left feminism, where there's a lot of emphasis on equal rights, but what are equal rights? Women over men, men over women, everyone has different ideas of what's given. Some will say that he's supposed to take charge and control and provide. But if he does it wrong, he could be in trouble for it. In worst cases, he could be accused of a crime. So now everybody's confused and pissed off. And these are the consequences of asking for what seems ideal, which is chivalry, in this reality. Granite says, you can't emasculate men and then complain they're effeminized. Who made it illegal for men to be men? <laughs> and he said, women, women's power over men is in their ability to shame them. Shame has been leveraged. And now the UK and the US have averaged 20 year olds in 2021 who have the testosterone levels of a 60 year old in 1940. This goes back to what was mentioned earlier about how hormones get dysregulated with rigid individualism. Now, masculine urges have been criminalized. There's a double standard of chauvinistic behavior. And he says that denial and self-deception is driving genders apart. Grannon says, I'm amazed that the divorce rates are as low as they are because I don't see that the competency, the boundaries, the commitments, the philosophy is there to withhold a relationship. I just don't see that. I don't see the emotional maturity. I don't see the compromise. I don't see the willingness to sacrifice. So when people come to me and say, my relationships suck, I'm like 0% surprised. It's not generational age-based. I know a couple going through it. They're both in their 70s. But I look at them and they have a fundamentally selfish view of life. So of course, they're frustrated with each other because I don't know what they expect a relationship to be. The solution here, he says, is to redefine love and romance, develop a moral compass. In redefining love and romance, you must at least be honest with yourself, if not also with your partner, about the transactional elements within a relationship, basically what you want. Because you're giving your life to someone, you're giving your precious time, attention, care, you're even giving your body, which is a huge investment. So you've got to be honest with yourself and your partner, if possible, about the transaction, really own the fact that there's an exchange going on here, 
put it forward in a conversation. At least be honest with yourself, rigorously honest about what you want, what you're willing to give and sacrifice in a relationship, what you will put up with and what you won't. Know what you want and need. And even on a sexual level, you've got to be honest with yourself as well. Because he says, imagine your sexual identity isn't fulfilled. What would the consequences be? Probably dissatisfaction in your life. is arguably a less stressful life if you're in a relationship where both parties are meeting each other's sexual needs completely. And that means that you have to go there in the conversation. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't even do that with themselves, he says. A lot of people edit their own desires and that it's a terrible shame. Because if they're not expressed but repressed, then it generates misery. Some believe the misery extends all the way into mental health issues. In developing a moral compass, if you don't do it, you have to realize that without morality, you're going to get exploited. You can't see or detect risk. And this is why people get themselves trapped in narcissistic relationships because of poor boundaries. Why? Because you don't know good from evil, Granin said, nor how to adhere to it with good boundaries. It takes strength of character, he says, to leave what you know is morally wrong. But there is rampant self-trashing, self-harming behaviors, which we see in a lot of sexual promiscuity that's being conflated with independence and power, which is actually disastrous. And this rampant promiscuity is killing the core culture. He asks, how can we progress as a culture if everyone lives like this? Men and women are irresponsibly having sex and children they don't even want, which again, arguably makes people mentally ill. And a lot of people are in relationships where maybe they consider it 15% okay. Why? Because we're all getting trampled on to some degree. And it's behind this ideology. Many times, Moral values are often seen as controversial or regressive, so no one is calling others out on this. As long as you have labels, badges, for example, I'm LGBT, well, that signals the right way, and then you won't get called out for immorality. Granin said this signaling actually implies dishonesty. It's virtue signaling that implies the lie that you're virtuous when you're really not. What's the excuse for not solving this? Well, People either have no values or junk values, or there's a subversion of values, or they're gonna blame it on colonial values. We're at a place where you can't have conversations on values, or you get labeled as being in the wrong tribe. For example, white, colonial dead white men. <laughs> okay, we see this with a lot of the woke culture, the Antifa BLM types who get extremely hostile, similar to what Granin says is, malignant borderline personality disorder if they are confronted on values. They are super fragile and focused on bullying others into submission, into disowning their own values. And everyone knows that this is a mess, he says. How did we get here, they ask. But they blame the patriarchy and dead white men. What's the real reason for not solving this? Well, he talks about anima animus possession, according to Carl Jung. And basically, this is where women are at risk of animus possession, where there's this negative image of femininity, and they come across as this ball-busting bitch, complaining, negative, critical, tyrannical. This is a woman who's very vain, false, jealous, but she's not really aware of it, and she projects it onto other women by being very highly critical and judgmental of them. She is cut off from her instincts, can maybe only relate to men on a sexual level. And rather than thinking about loving or caring for a man, she considers instead if she could sleep with him and if he can be manipulated. Men at risk of anima possession are men who negate or push down the yang soul energy within them. It's a spineless wimp. He doesn't know how to initiate or take action. He could be moody, throw temper tantrums. He's basically the classic beta male, blue-pilled, cuck, soy boy, <laughs> as Granin put it. This person may have religious or transcendent experiences, but considers them nothing more than a drug-induced illusion. He always doubts options, choices. He gets lost in contemplation, and that's why he doesn't take any action. These men have lost their way because they're shadow-possessed, they're anima-possessed. Granin says, masculinity is spontaneous in action. A man 
being his own self, that's masculinity. It's not machismo, super macho. And he's encouraging people, when you're thinking of this, don't fall back into dogma and ideology. We become afraid of our own authenticity because it's spontaneous and chaotic. That's why we try to find ideological solutions and rules when the cues should come internally from your principles rather than externally the ideologies. Men feel their masculinity has been attacked, shamed, criminalized. They've given up. They've abandoned the field, he says. And women are lost on the field, unhappily, resentfully, taking up men's abandoned places. Men aren't allowed to be men anymore. Women aren't allowed to be women anymore. We have abandoned each other, he says. We need each other. Yin needs yang. With relationships, there is danger, risk. It can be combative by nature. There's a battle for power. That doesn't mean you have to hate men or women. If you fundamentally have a problem with a gender, you probably shouldn't be in a relationship, he says. Get over it. Deal with it. If you don't like what a man or a woman is, get over it. Don't go out and date somebody or something you don't like. You want love, but how do you love what you don't like or respect? If you do that, you're just going to hurt people while you're acting out of your own unresolved trauma issues. Grant incites Sam Vaknin's invulnerability signals, which are identified as the six horsemen of the intimacy apocalypse, basically things that make intimacy in a relationship very difficult. Number one, the invulnerability signaling where both genders are autonomous, hyper-independent, unemotional, uninvolved, totally self-sufficient. Where have we heard this before? <laughs> This we do not need each other type of mentality and I don't need anybody and that makes me awesome. And Granin says, well, that's pure narcissism. Notice everybody has their own goals and you see this a lot in society, this flashing with boss bitch, alpha male. It's really forbidden now to, for a woman to tell a man, I love you, I need you, I can't live without you, protect me, control me. <laughs> that would not be politically correct, right? And is seen by many as clingy. But here's the thing, the polarity creates attraction. Without it, attraction is lost. Yet that's not politically correct. In fact, your sexuality isn't politically correct, Grannon says. If it was politically correct, he points out, yeah, that would be awful. Number two, gender vertigo, the abolition of gender roles and sexual scripts, where we now have normalized confusion regarding the appropriate codes of conduct and behavior. Many of us are getting into relationships where we're having to continually reestablish what's appropriate behavior, what's okay, what's not. For example, one person might see something as cheating and the other one's like, no, that's not. This is totally normal. Granin points out that women are often attracted to assholes because of familiarity or conflating it with protection and strength or seeing what's unpredictable as exciting. And he also points out that with good boys, there's really nothing to tame there. And in the core of women's nature is the desire to want to tame something. And so he says, consider what's attracting you. What's exciting, familiar, strong about this guy? And is that something you can build a life with? Number three, the stalled revolution. Both men and women are regarding themselves now in masculine terms as breadwinners, money makers. We're even seeing this with politicians talking about pregnant people. And yes, PC culture revels in this. This creates tension in relationships over who's making the money and who isn't. It makes relationships more transactional in nature. Who deserves loyalty and who doesn't? But again, he says, you got to have that conversation where you address the trading transactional aspect of a relationship and not repress it. Number four, gender fluidity. This is where we see both the biological sex of people and the socio-culturally determined genders are now up for grabs and subject to all manner of alteration. This is creating collective confusion about gender roles. And on an individual level, maybe there are some advantages to it, but not collectively, Granin argues. He says, yes, be kind to different people, but fringe should not become mainstream because it's increasing divorce rates. Everyone just doing what they want actually isn't kind. It's a mess for society. At a certain level, it does become unkind and pure chaos. If we don't vocally push back on this chaotic nonsense, he says, it's an anti-life death cult that no good can come from. It appeals to a fragile narrative of 
borderline personality disorder, this becomes a religious to them, like zealots capable of murder. And what we're seeing really in culture now with this push for gender fluidity is part agenda, but also part shadow possession that was spoken of earlier with the anima animus possession in men and women. But he does say if there is an agenda, it has not taken long to push us into this state because of our own anima animus possession. Number five, defiant agency. Conflict, confrontation, basically being experienced when acting on your own behalf. It can come across as in your face, obnoxious assertiveness that disrespects others' boundaries. It can come across aggressive, um, almost narcissistic, if not outright narcissistic. And people can defend themselves and explain themselves away by saying, well, this is just me being independent. But when you ask that person for help or cooperation, you might be answered with something like, basically, that's not my responsibility. Well, that's not me. That's not about me. I'm about me. I'm just doing what I'm doing. So I'm not going to go help with that because that's not my, my thing to tend to. Number six, enshrined double standard. There are claims of empowerment that are coming from this rampant sexual self-trashing and self-harming behavior that we are seeing in society now, there's this duality of self-denial and self-deception, he says, that's driving the genders apart, where men and women, yes, are giving up on each other in droves, basically because people are denying and repressing their own divine feminine masculine characteristics. We're being encouraged to lie, Granite says. I don't like lying. I'm really big on honesty. All mental illness, all sin, all craziness, all the poison in the world starts with a lie. It starts with one little lie. We'll just say this and everything will be okay. It never fucking is. It's always a mess. Honesty or nothing, give me honesty or give me death. We also need each other, Granin says. Yin needs yang. Yang needs yin. We are very sad now because we lost each other. Women didn't just lose men, men didn't just lose women. We've kind of lost each other. Where we used to have community, we've lost that. It's miserable, absolutely miserable. This life is only semi worth living with love in it. Men need women, women need men. Grennan's quote, naive suggestions. Well, there's 10 of them. Starting with number one, individually express what you want, ask for it, including your vulnerability in a forthright way. He says, if you're talking to a person who cannot deal with such a conversation or your vulnerability, move on, save yourself time, move on. Yes, it's not easy, but this person is infected with ideology, not principles. They are adverse to intimacy. They are invulnerable. Number two, collectively. We've got to have a unified set of rules for cooperating, building over the long term, not short term, not for consumption. He says, consumers make shit boyfriends and shit girlfriends. They try to consume their relationship. And when they don't get the service or the nonstop party, you will be seen as a failed service that they ordered. They'll stop consuming and discard, similar to the dump and discard that we see in narc relationships, right? Short relationships happen more often with this kind of consumption-based mentality. And notice he says that most items today are consumed quickly. You will be treated as a malfunctioning product and discarded quickly if we don't have these unified set of rules for cooperating and building over the long term. Number three, consider the economic backdrop of relationships. Define fair division of labor. What is a fair exchange? Because he says resentment kills relationships by first creating resentment that rots the relationship. And if gratitude isn't expressed, then resentment builds. Who's doing what in this relationship is a necessary, albeit perhaps uncomfortable, conversation that you need to have? What does it mean practically, economically, to be in a long-term relationship? Jobs and men have stalled in catching up to working mothers. And a lot of women feel resentment for doing what is considered the lion's share of emotional and physical work for the family. They are often working what's called a second shift after they get off of their day job. So the economy of gratitude needs to be cultivated, but first coming from a place of understanding who is grateful to whom and for what, Granin says. Number four, cultural acceptance of sex and gender differences and preferences. He says an end to unigender and the drive for everyone to be the same thing. We don't have the same strengths, skills, desires, nor should we. If people want to be gender fluid, then okay, let them. But advertisers, marketers, and corporations should not promote the idea that this is normal, good, or primal, he says. It's not. We're all here. 
because of heterosexual unions between men and women. That's a biological fact. It might not be PC, he says. But humanity stops apart from that fact. And that's a problem. This isn't about controlling individuals, but controlling culture. Number five, humility and respect for others with compassion and appreciation. If you're a rigid individualist consumer, you can't appreciate your partner's desires, dreams, traumas, hardships. You're only fixated on what they do for you. For example, if they're tired, he says, it's an inconvenience for you. Reframe this to get past it because contempt for others and life is a cultural ideological infection. This is the ideology that everything is shit, everyone cheats, everything is fake and pointless. Number six, drop the poisonous need to associate empowerment and liberation with promiscuity. It's untrue, he says. Even the body sends risk and shame signals because it isn't safe psychologically. And that's just aside from the physical risks. Number seven, defeat consumerism with appreciation, gratitude, humility, and reverence. Realize, I didn't make this, I couldn't make this, nobody could make this. That reminds me that I don't have the right to harm you. It's hard to behave criminally. It's hard to have contempt for life. Rigid individuality is overcome with empathy, being able to put yourself in another person's shoes. I can imagine what life is like from your perspective. You don't have to be kind or sympathetic to be empathic, but it will definitely help you to overcome rigid individuality. Number eight, manipulation and coercion. This is something that four or five-year-olds do, but shouldn't be permitted by adults. Openly and directly ask. If you don't, then it's not their fault they didn't give it. Resolve your counter-dependency, which is basically your hate for women or men. You've got to ask yourself, do I like this person before you love them? Do I like this person before I lust them? The notion that it's all about me, that's consumerism, that's rigid individualism, and maybe in some cases, narcissism, yeah. This will need refreshing over time because familiarity breeds contempt. It's an ongoing process, he says, that must be watered and tended to. Contempt is defeated by reverence. Number nine, rigidly individualistic definitions of love. We're putting too much emphasis on making our lives about romantic love with a man or a woman. We didn't used to do that, he said. We had communities, churches, people we worked with. We need to return to that or it'll drive us crazy. People will disappoint you. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. Number 10, integrate your shadow. And this is basically the cultural and the individual shadow possessions that we're dealing with. It comes up with the individual or collective when there is a denial of the truth about who you are or who people are. We all have darkness in us, and that's okay, he says, but become more honest, moral, enlightened. If you aren't enlightened, love will destroy you, which I thought was an interesting point. He said this is because when you love somebody, you get closer. That creates intimacy. Intimacy generates more shadow activation. So you have to be someone enlightened to survive it, or you're going to get lost in projection. You'll be convinced that your partner is a demon or an arc or whatever. And so when it comes to exploring your shadow side, he says, define what love is for you. Write it down on your own. What's your idea of a relationship? How have you allowed love and relationship to deviate from this? Where have you allowed deviation from your conscious definitions? That is shadow, he says. Well, you basically said you wanted this, but you didn't live that. You allowed, you permitted something else. That's your shadow. And he says, in terms of relationships... For it to work out in a way that is actually fulfilling, you would have to be shadow integrated, individuated, enlightened to a point where you no longer cared about being in a relationship. You know nobody like that, but that's the way that you're so individually fulfilled that there's no anxiety, possessiveness, there's no need. And then you say, why be together at all? Well, these are good questions and good points, I think. I'll give my commentary in the next video. If you want to catch that, make sure that you're subscribed and that you've activated the bell for notifications. Till next time, thanks for watching. Be blessed.